Let's do some crucial mechanics revision. The area underneath a force against distance graph is always work done. And because work done is equal to the change of energy, it's also the change of energy. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about materials, when it could be the work done in stretching or compressing an object, or the work done by a gravitational field. On the other hand, if we have a force against time graph, the area underneath the graph is the impulse. The impulse, on the other hand, is defined as the average force multiplied by the time that it acts on the object. Because of Newton's second law, which means that the net force is equal to delta P the, divided by delta T, the rate of change of momentum, F times delta T is equal to the change of momentum. So this means that this area here is the impulse, but also it means that it is equal to the change of momentum. Here's another really useful equation. Power is equal to force times velocity. We need to be able to derive this equation. Remember that power is equal to work done or energy per unit time. So if we said the work done equal to force times distance, distance over time is equal to force times velocity. There is a catch though. If the displacement and the force are not perpendicular to one another, the work done equation becomes F D cosine of the angle between them. And if that's the case, the power equation actually becomes F V cosine of theta. In an elastic collision, kinetic energy is conserved, but also momentum is conserved. Whereas in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved and momentum is conserved. Generally, momentum is always conserved. The next one is really important. The conditions for simple harmonic motion are that the acceleration is proportional to the displacement and it's directed towards the equilibrium. The defining equation is that A is equal to minus omega squared times X. You can also get a graph which kind of looks like this, A against X, and the fact that it's a straight line through the origin tells us that the acceleration is proportional to the displacement, and the fact that it has a negative gradient tells us that they're in opposite directions, i.e. is directed towards the equilibrium. Here's a little practice question. We have the following graph of X against T. Can we work out the maximum acceleration from the graph. Okay, well, we're going to use the defining equation that a is equal to minus omega squared times x. Now, if omega is a constant, the maximum acceleration will occur at the amplitude, so a max will be minus omega squared times the amplitude. Okay, well, this will be minus 2 pi over the time period, don't forget the square, multiply by the amplitude, which is going to be minus 2 pi, which is going to be 4 pi squared. The time period in this case is 100. Unit check, they've given us milliseconds, so this will be 100 times 10 to the power of minus 3. Now I've already squared the top, so I'm just going to square the bottom of this fraction. And then I'm going to be multiplying that by the amplitude, which is just 5 millimeters, i.e. 5 times 10 to the power of minus 3. Putting this into the calculator, we're going to get around 19.7 meters per second squared. The natural frequency is the frequency at which an object will oscillate after an initial disturbance and the force is removed. Now, if we apply a driving force and if the frequency of the driving force matches the natural frequency, resonance occurs. When that happens, the amplitude reaches a maximum.
This is represented by this classic amplitude against frequency curve and we can see that it's reached a maximum at the natural frequency. Notice that for to introduce damping into the system the peak is going to be lower and then a little bit more to the left. So this one here is with damping. Let's also talk a little bit about springs. So the rules for adding up springs in series and parallels are opposite to those of resistors. For springs in series, k total is equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2 raised to the negative 1. And if they were to be in parallel, we just simply add the two spring constants together. Now, why are those rules like that? You may be asked to derive them and the derivation is actually quite easy. So let's just make some space uh, for it. So if they are are actually in parallel then the actual force is distributed between the two so we have F1 and F2 so I can say that in parallel F total is equal to F1 plus F2 uh, because F is equal to Kx they all going to have the same um, extension so Kx K total X is equal to K1x uh, plus k2x. As I said, they have the same extension, so we can just cancel those out, i.e. k total is equal to k1 plus k2. Now, if they are in parallel, they have the same force that is applied for to them, because if I pull this spring down, this, this spring k2 will experience the same force as the spring k1, because they're directly connected to one another. So, in series, what we add is is actually the extension. So x total is equal to x1 plus x2. Now extension is equal to force over the spring constant which is equal to the force over k1 plus the force over k2. The force is cancelled because they experience the same force and we have proved that 1 over k total is equal to 1 over k1 plus 1 over k2. If you're watching this video you're probably revising for a level physics tomorrow best of luck and also have a look at this video right over here about momentum in 2d which is an important topic that you need to master right over here